e-collaborate with the SIS project to make this tool that we all use, and it turns out to be far bigger than anyone expected, to try to make it work for the rest of us, or for everybody, I mean. <coughs> so we really thank you for your patience and your ongoing support, and so many of you have say nice things to us in person when you recognize that we're all just doing the best we can, um, and none of us believe that we are providing what w needs to be provided to run a university of this caliber. So we expect 1718 to be another big year. I expect things to start to feel a little more, um, I don't think, I, I, to be perfectly honest, I don't think things will get better in 1718. <laughs> Let's just be, you know, I'm just gonna be honest, you know? There's nothing like setting expectations. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I, you know, I think we have a lot of work to do, and, and I'm speaking to the graduate audience, and I know that there are a lot of other audiences on campus who feel the very same way about their tools. I'm just speaking to us graduate uh, folks. And um, I think 1718 is gonna be another tough, intense, focused year and then we really will start to see some um, improvements trickle down and feel better. And I think, I say to my internal staff that 1920 is gonna be a really great year. <laughs> because, because, you know, 1718 is gonna be, I'm saying it right here, we have a lot of development still to do, a lot of decisions still to make, a lot of people to consult. There's still some real building to be done. And then, well, 1819, 1819 is where you start to you start to tinker and you start to make it better. You know, you really start to get the things that we all envisioned. I don't know, three years ago, when we said, "Oh, this system is going to do this and it's going to do this, and then you're going to be able to see everything, and we're going to be one big happy advising community." That's where I think those things start to trickle in, and we start to see the benefits of the data we've collected, and we start to understand where our data is going and how. And then 1920 is when we are just like golden. We got it. That's that's sort of my vision. <laughs> Pardon? And uh, no, hush, hush. No, 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 no. That won't happen. <laughs> For those, <laughs> we will all be retired before there's a new system. I can pretty much guarantee. I mean, there's a couple of very youthful people in the room. Maybe they'll they'll be struggling. So anyway, um, in the interest of moving forward and being. Um, to communal, working together in the next coming year, I want to, uh, you've already heard this, but I want to say it publicly, and I want us all to um, express our gratitude to Solomon Loeffler, who has been willing to step up <laughs> as our interim dean, our, our interim director of graduate student support. I explained to you what we're doing and how we're combining those functions, and Solomon's going to lead us into 1718 and 1819 and 1920. Um, in a really effective way that uh, we're... <laughs> there we go. Oh, Solomon, for those of you who didn't hear, Solomon's taking us straight to 1920. Um, so anyway, we are going to need a lot of input from you. We're going to be designing more tools. We're looking forward to working with you. Um, stay in touch with us about your needs so that we can make sure you're heard. And now Fiona wanted to say a few more words before we get on to the business of our meeting. Um, oh, okay, thank you. So um, I also want to say thank you. And I echo everything that um, Andrea said about the incredible contributions that you have made um, to um, give perspective and input on SIS. I also want to thank you for your patience in um, enduring um, all sorts of, um, to put it politely, subpar um, things this year. Um, but in addition, what I, I, I'm humbled to see from you is the fact that you're doing all of this while really um, being that point person, the person who cares, f um, the face of the university for our graduate students. Um, I know from um, you know my own experience how um, the GSAO in the department, or in some case, some of the large ones, there's more than one. Um, you're, you're the jack or jill of all trades. Um, you're the problem solver. Um, you're the shrink. Um, you're the mom. Um, sometimes um, you serve various other roles, um, you know, financial advice, wh whatever. And you bring such incredible commitment to the students in the way that you do this. 
So I wanted to personally thank you for that. Um, your dedication and genuine concern about our students was so evident to me in September when um, everything was melting down over student awards. And um, I knew this already, but it was so evident to the SIS team that you took this personally that um, your students in distress were um, a, a, everything, every bit as egregious as if you were the ones who weren't getting paid. And that just speaks volumes to me and to others about um, how seriously you take your work. So thank you so much. And I think everybody deserves I agree. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for stopping by. Uh, Fiona was squeezing us in between meetings and we've thrown her schedule off because our agenda is off by a few minutes. We'll make it up. Um, <laughs> drive safely. We need you. We need you to come back from Oakland. <laughs> okay, now I'd like to let, I'm going to let Rod take it over. Um, for those of you who have follow-up questions, other things you want to talk about, we will try to take them at the end of the meeting. We want to make sure that our special guests get time to talk about what they came for. So catch us later if you've got questions that you feel like you want to address today. There you go. So I'm going to try using this lapel and see if this works so that I can actually not be awkward up here. So good morning, everybody. My name is Rod Santos. I work in the Office of the Registrar. I supervise the Residence Affairs Unit. I have a team of uh, three staff, self-included, of that three, and additional uh, one FTE of students that help us process all of our documents. Um, in general, residency, you folks probably know what residency is all about, whether or not a student's going to be considered in-state or out-of-state. But I wanted to talk to you folks today about um, what exactly do we do, the other things that we do, so you have a sense of our functionalities, because it's just not determining who's in-state or out-of-state. Um, I appreciate Andrea's like uh, talking about the C, um, CS and the SIS project, because as you can imagine, um, we too also had to uh, deal with the with the SIS, dealing with our old legacy system. Um, our module and residency and the questions, about 250 of them, had to be designed from scratch. Um, the module they called it the most complex um, from scratch module that they had to create, um, I believe, for the campus. If I'm not under, if I'm not um, um, mistaken. <laughs> right, right. But that's because part of my, our design last year was to put together, this is not a biochemical pathway. <laughs> this is our actual process map of, of what residency looks like and determinations and logic that's built into our system, just to give you a sense of the imme immense amount of work that was going on and behind the scenes to get there. So part of my job is also systems administration. So anyone has issues with the with Cal Central, with residency, with their documents not uploading, with anything not coming up, with an SLR not showing up on their checklist, that all goes to me. So unfortunately, plus I also have to evaluate. We have about 16,000 applications that run through um, our system um, between the months of April and August. So if you can imagine, um, our, our shop is very busy during uh, this time frame right now as we speak. So um, I wanted to give you just a sense of that, but also to, um, not only that, but I, I was a, a advisor for about 11 years prior to being in this position in the registrar's office for the past five. So I definitely appreciate the frontline work that you do when students are freaking out about their fees, because yes, if a student has a pending status in residency, their money will not disperse. And so we've been putting that message out to students so that they know they need to submit an SLR and they can't stay in legal residence, and that they, they need to take care of their documents, because if not, they want their money for their rent, for uh, their stipends, or if they get any kind of pay from you folks, from the departments. So um, the other thing that I wanted to talk about, too, is um, some of you have asked, inquired about um, knowing the status of your students in terms of residency. And I would recommend that uh, those of you who are out there who need to have large departments that don't have time to manually look up every single student and their status, ask whoever in grad division handles queries so that you can pull up, and there could be um, you know, a, a way for you folks to pull up students by department. So, so um, I, I would recommend, highly recommend that you do that, especially as we get closer to the start of the term, okay? One of the other things that my office also does is we are the only entity on campus that can actually officially change a student's immigration status 
and see yes. So, and I, it's usually me as well. So what I would say is that if any of you students end up switching from like an F1 visa and end up applying for, for a green card or permanent resident status, please feel free to, to contact me and send me documents. It might take me a little bit of time to, to process it all, but uh, just to let you know that um, in, in terms of immigration, that kind of thing, let, uh, let me know, okay? Um, one other thing too about immigration is AB 540. So um, when it comes to AB 540, a lot of, there's a, there's a, there's a misconception out there that AB 540 is just for undocumented students, and the answer is no. It's not just for undocumented students. I would say um, a little, of, of all of our AB 540 students, about half of them are uh, graduate students who left the state of California, and, but graduated from a California high school, but came back um, for their graduate studies after leaving uh, for the undergraduate years. So there is no inherent you know, um, disadvantage for student being AB 540 as, an, as a first year uh, graduate student, and if they decide to hold that AB 540 status for their entire time, they're gonna be charged the same as a resident, okay? So, do we want a question? Oh, okay. Will you repeat the question? Yeah, the, re the question was DACA, okay? So DACA refers to, to Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals. Um, a couple things about DACA is that currently um, students are going through the renewal process and there hasn't been any indication thus far from the current presidential administration that there's gonna be any changes to that. However, that is subject to potentially change. Deferred action for childhood arrivals is not technically considered a legal status. It just guarantees legal presence in the United States. So DACA is really meant for, stu uh, what we find is DACA students are ones in which they are uh, traditionally undocumented, in which they might have had an expired visa, they overstayed their visa, or um, they're truly undocumented and, and um, to, to the United States. So what I would say is, um, and you can refer to, if you go to our registrar's website and do a search DACA, you can find all our policies regarding DACA um, available on our website. So I wanna let you know that a search function, the registrar's website, is really, really sharp and really good. It doesn't give you like 15,000 different, uh, different um, items. It will give, get you right to the, to the actual item itself, okay? So uh, that's a good question. Um, and if you folks have questions about immigration, please feel free to contact me directly. Because immigration can be very complicated um, because we look at immigration over one year prior to this term starting. So it, it gets really complicated. I've seen students with four or five immigration statuses at the same time, and I have to kind of look and make sure that each one is, is uh, appropriate for residency, so. Um, the other thing I want to discuss too is documents, because I know this is the time when um, some of your continuing graduate students have uh, hopefully applied for, for residency. We opened up on March 1st, um, after talking with those of you in grad division, to help expedite the process somewhat so we can get some of your graduate students taken care of and done with before fees get assessed mid-July. So the good news is that we did clear a couple hundred graduate students actually in the months of March and April. Thank goodness, thanks to all of you. So that's helped, but we still have about 400, 500, possibly 600 other students that are they're hanging out there that haven't submitted all their documents. So I wanted to briefly go over some of those documents. Um, the first thing is a physical presence. One thing, some of the things that we ask for for physical presence are things like um, the arrival date. And by the way, we have a section on our website, our newly redesigned website just last year, um, for residency requirements for graduate students. So we have a section there just for graduate students. If you go to that website, it's, it, 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 it speaks to you in plain English and tells you the kinds of documents that we're gonna be asking for, okay? So you can always refer yourselves and to students and your colleagues over to um, our website, okay? So for physical presence, summer documents and arrival documents. So for arrival documents, we usually ask for um, bank or credit card statements, airplane um, or uh, flight itineraries, something showing when the student arrived into the state of California. So just keep that in mind um, as students are asking if they have questions about those kinds of documents. We're really wanting to know how they get here and do you have proof that you got here. A bank statement's perfectly fine if they, don't ha if they drove in, that will work for us. Another thing is summer whereabouts, because we have to guarantee and see that a student was here for 366 days, right, prior to the term starting. So for students that um, are, may not be here for the summer, many of you know that um, if we get a letter from the department saying that the student was um, out of the state for academic or research-related purposes, we will totally take that. And about 10 of you departments actually sent us memos indicating that was the case. Um, that's fantastic because all we really need is to know, yep, they attended one of your orientations, 
um, back in August. Yep, they're, they're working on, on research, on active research um, over the summer, and they are actually, they, they will be outside of the state perfectly fine, but they will be representing the university by doing their research. We get that. So um, some of you have been able to provide those memos for us, and those of you departments who have not done that for us yet, and you have larger departments, please feel free to contact me, and I can walk you through the kind of memos that we, um, that we, that we accept, okay? Um, the other thing about um, summer dates and whatnot is that we really want to look and make sure, because we have to check that the student was actually here, here um, for an entire full year. So when you provide those memos to us about their summer and their summer experiences and so on and so forth, it's helpful for us to have the dates from May to August and have a specific date. You could say May to August, that will work. You could say, say for the entire summer, that will work for us too. But when we start seeing June and July, ugh, that gives us two months of wiggle room. Like we don't know whether or not the students are actually here or what they're doing during that time frame. So the more information you can provide us and more comprehensive it is, the less we'll have to keep going back and forth with the student, okay? So that's the one thing for summer whereabouts, and that is in including May to August or just the whole summer. That's really helpful for us. Let's talk about intent. We're starting to see some non-resident grad students for the second years, partly because um, students are supposed to relinquish all their ties from their previous state and acquire all California ties, such as driver's license, vehicle registration, voter's registration, taxes, and state taxes if they earn income in California. What we're, what we're finding now is that despite my three emails that I sent to all continuing graduate students, and you folks know this, you do with the grad students on the ground floor, that sometimes they don't get their ties in time. I, um, I was talking to my colleague Maria, who's also another evaluator in my office. She said we're starting to see students that acquire their ties in April and May of this year. <laughs> so that's not good. So we tell students within the first term that you're here, um, all your ties from out of state should be relinquished, basically, and acquired um, here in California, your driver's license. And nowadays, what I'm hearing from your graduate students is that in order for them to get their driver's license or voter's registration, um, you have to schedule an appointment sometimes one to two months in advance at the DMV. So I think nowadays they're not allowing students to walk in, uh, not allowing folks to just to walk in and get their business done. So we, we recommend that if you have folks that are coming from out of state and trying to change their ties, especially your new graduate students coming up, Advise them to, to take care of that stuff at the DMV and schedule an appointment even before they come into state, even, I would say, just so that we can help guarantee that this won't be an issue one year from now, okay? So um, that's an important thing. Um, and so the other things, too, taxes and W-2s, those get complicated, you know, um, as well. Um, generally speaking, if students have questions about those taxes and W-2s, feel free to contact our office, okay? Let's talk about readmissions, because not only do I handle all the online SLRs, but my team also handles all the readmissions, one paper form at a time. So um, a couple things that I want to tell you folks about readmissions is filing fee and in absentia um, and advance to candidacy. So we oftentimes, I know you graduate students, they try to get all their research and get their dissertation, get everything filed on, on time, and I understand that. Unfortunately, there's some of those students, you know who those students are, that that, oh, I didn't get everything done, I need to somehow re-enroll for, for another semester after I've been given all this time to get this work done. And then they have to apply for readmissions, they submit a statement of legal residence, or they don't, and we ask for one, and we find out, oh, they actually don't qualify for residency because they've been out of state. They've been living out of state for the past three years, and they end up becoming non-residents. So a couple things about the readmissions process, at any time a student applies for readmission, that is after filing fee, that is after in absentia, that's after um, advance of candidacy. What, what's not that? after in absentia. Not, not after in absentia, but advance of candidacy and filing fee. If they have to re-enroll, apply for readmissions, they get re-evaluated for residency all over again. So the important piece is to remind your students that if, if they end up having to re-enroll at whatever point, after they have this time to do their research, that there's a chance that they may not qualify for residency when they come back, and they may be um, liable for that non-resident tuition. It's a huge thing that we keep, we, start, we keep seeing from students and so on and so forth. There's a lot at stake in, that, in terms of that money and, and understand that they want to com complete their degree, but they need to know that in advance, okay? Um, the other thing is when they apply for readmissions, let's just say they do apply for readmissions, whether or not they're after advanced accounts or after filing fee, let's just say, but let's just say one of your students decides to take a break from university, de decides to stop out for whatever reason, medical issues or family issues or having to go home. 
Um, one important thing is that when they apply for readmissions, they need to submit a statement of legal residence with us. Because the issue is that they don't do that, and that's um, students that come from self-support programs, however, though, are exempt from that. We don't look at residency for self-supported programs, for those of you who are advisors for those programs. But anybody else, then they have to submit a statement of legal residence. What if a student doesn't submit an SLR? We have to pen that status. What happens when you pen the status? No residency status, no money gets to the student. So it's super important to have that statement of legal residence submitted along with the readmissions application every time, except for self-supported programs, okay? Um, the other thing is, I work in the office of the registrar. I share my wall with Ricky Toe. Anybody know Ricky Toe? Anyone had to work with Ricky Toe? <laughs> There's about a, a lot of people in this room, yes. So um, him and I, we work together also on fees. <laughs> we also work together on late enrollments um, because we handle the statements of legal residence. Um, so one thing I wa he wanted to um, project to you folks also as you're um, learning about the new system and whatnot, and is number one, if you end there, ever end up having a student that readmits or late enrollment after the fifth week, we get issues. Because what happens at that point is that everything is manual at that point. So a student you know, might, might end up getting canceled, they have to manually be added onto their courses, they have to run around and get signatures and so on and so forth. But here's the other piece that you might not be aware of. Any student that enrolls after the fifth week doesn't get counted for census date. What does that mean? Money. Precisely, you don't get funding to your department. And in this budget crisis, we all know, goodness, money is very, we're very strapped for cash nowadays. So that's the one thing I want to kind of also, we also want to reinforce with you folks that that, can, um, that has been an issue um, recently. We want to bring that to your attention. Um, and then lastly, enrollment. When it comes to enrollment, um, pretend you, a lot of students got, have, it, it's been hard for students to get used to, the, to Cal Central, obviously because it's a brand new system, but it looks like a lot of other tools that are out there. And um, a lot of students forget that it's like Amazon. You take your item and put it into the shopping cart, then you check out and enroll, right? So that's the issue that we're seeing a lot with students, that they're forgetting, oh, this is a shopping cart, it's like Amazon. I have to pick what I like and then actually check out. So that's one thing, you know, use that as an analogy for your graduate students, especially those who are used to the old system, um, just to remind them that they can't get enrolled unless they actually add all the classes and finish their, their shopping cart. Whew, okay. So the last bit of news um, for you folks is that um, in the upcoming, I would say, one to two years, they're going to be revamping our residency policy um, at, the, at the highest level at UCOP. So um, I will, we will, let, of course, let you know what those changes are to our residency policy, but we understand that it's, um, it's going to be happening, my goodness, this upcoming fall. And the last time we really had our, re our residency policy looked at was in 1993. So just to give you a sense, we're hoping that that means that it's going to be easier for graduate students because us as deputies, we, we get together every single year to talk about, do we really have to ask for all these documents? Believe me, if I didn't have to do go through all those documents, I'd be happy. But so I understand that it, it is cumbersome for, for your students, but we'll do everything we can in the next year to help streamline this for your students and for us so that we can just get through the process and go on with life. And they can do their, do their duties as, as GSIs and, and be grad students and teach our undergrads and change the world and whatnot. So um, lastly, I wanted to talk about uh, contacting us because um, during this time frame, it can get really crazy busy. Um, recently, I've had students contact me directly which actually could answer, be answered by our general line. So I wanted to kind of set kind of the standard for you folks. If you folks have any weird situations, some strange situations, um, the student goes to you directly, you try to figure out, it doesn't work out, you are welcome to contact me directly. Feel free to send me an email or call me. Uh, my email address is rtsantos at berkeley.edu. And my phone number is 21238. That's my direct line. If I'm not on the office for whatever reason, my colleague Maria Solis, she um, is all, she's my backup, so she's the other evaluator, and the two of us are the ones that do all the evaluations for our campus, okay? So um, feel free to contact us. If students have a general question, right, they should really contact our general line, which is ORS at berkeley.edu. Um, we actually have our, we literally have, um, all of our students are answering these general questions um, all the time. My, my student staff, and they're, they're well-trained, and they know how to answer these, these questions very, very well. And if it's anything weird, they'll let us know. And this is our direct line, too, as well. Um, students should not, if they're already through our process, they're already going through our process, they don't want to call Cal Student Central. They don't. Because if not, they'll be caught up into the queue. And they could be end up 
And when August rolls around, the Golden Bear orientation for the undergrads, it's gonna be really hard for students to contact us. I'd recommend that you have students contact us directly. Keep in mind too that we will be busy, so we recommend that students send us an email so we can actually document it and, and have it be a part of a student's file, okay? That's the preferred. We also offer office hours too, in-person office hours. Um, they are Tuesdays and Fridays from 10 to 12 and Wednesdays, Thursdays from 2 to 4. We've had these office hours year-round for the past five years that I've been in, in, our, in the position. It's, it's worked really well. So that way students have an opportunity to come in and talk to us if they really need to talk to us. Um, my other colleague, Annie, will be um, handling office hours and answering questions from students and grad students. So, oh, we're, uh, you can check in at 120 Sproul Hall. This is gonna, they're gonna check in at, at Cal Student Central. So have students check in at Cal Student Central. The good news is that our lines are, go really quickly. So um, during that time frame, and usually if there's too many students, then Maria, myself, and Annie will all be working office hours to help see students, okay? But please tell your students, submit your documents sooner than later. Two deadlines. The SLR deadline is July 15th. This is a hard deadline. In other words, any not submitted SLRs will be all canceled. And, and will disappear from the students, um, Cal Student Central, their checklist. This is a hard deadline, okay? Documents, August 1st, okay? And this is our constant deadlines for um, year round, okay? So I guess we have time for a few questions. I was able to kind of breeze through this. Yeah, ooh, we'll go, oh gosh, okay, All let's. Right, do you want me to run out of the microphone or do you want to try to repeat the question? Oh gosh. Um, like, like, on you. Okay. <laughs> thank you, Andrea. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. <laughs> so first of all, thank you to you for all the work that you're doing, and thank you for giving me residency when I was an undergrad back in the dark ages. Oh. Um, <laughs> uh, so I, I have a, f a few questions for you. I hope it's okay. Yeah. Um, I know things um, were a little backed up last year, and maybe oh, that yes. was due to CIS, and I'm wondering, do you anticipate the same types of issues this year? Um, it's funny because every week is a new adventure with, with CS. I, you know, I'm sure a lot of you kind of agree with me on this one. Right now, our process times is, is about two to three weeks. So we're actually, um, we were ahead. And I, in my opinion, I think we're pretty much on schedule uh, from what I can tell. So we are well aware of the upcoming deadlines. We want to get as many files done before fees get assessed in mid-July. We also want to finish up our files as much as possible. Uh, before August 14th when money gets dispersed, financial aid disperses. So I, I would say that we're, we're well on track uh, as far yeah. as I can tell. Yeah, Great. yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, the second thing was, was news to me and I guess I didn't understand it along with your deadlines. Um, you said this SLR must be submitted in order for stipends to disperse. So like in my department, I'm in EECS and we have you know 133 students coming right. in, some claiming their residents who won't be and vice versa. Right. So um, might it be that they wouldn't get their fall stipend? Not, if, not d it depends, because if a student was considered a non-resident at any point, their status will stay the, the way it is. But it's for students that have submitted the SLR and were waiting for their documents or they didn't respond to our request or on their checklist, they haven't uploaded their documents. If the SLR status, the residency status is pending, it's those students that may be affected uh, from getting their, from getting their uh, money um, because they haven't submitted their documents. Yeah. Oh, yeah, we're talking about second, second years. years, got it. Second okay. years, yes, okay. yeah. yes. Second years. But it will also apply to new graduate students also. So if you've got new graduate students that haven't submitted the SLR yet, and it's not, yeah, yeah. or, or, or uh, even if they're non-residents, there has to be some sort of status. The interesting thing about CES this year and what it's done for us is that without a residency status, nothing really happens. With a, with a student's um, ongoing financial record and enrollment and so on. There, there's a lot of, because it's integrated, we're now, in a, we're, not, we're now in a point now where if a student, a new brand new student, who's like say an international student, doesn't submit that statement of legal residence, and their status, there, there's a pending status, or there's no status, then that might be an issue for the student. So we're telling every student that's out there who's new, they must submit the SLR. 
So when a student applies for admission and indicates that they are not a California resident, they still have to submit this form saying, I am not a California resident. So keep in mind that when they submit their application, that's the admission side. Uh -huh. So after, you get, after the SIR, then they have to submit the statement of legal residence. Indicating that I'm aware that I am not a California resident. Correct. Yep. And if for non for non resident students, it's pretty easy. Um, it, it usually can answer within six questions, and it's basically done. But for students that ha are claiming residency, you usually have to fill out the longer form based on the logic. How are they keen to do that? How do they know to do that? On their checklist. It appears on their checklist. So what we've been encountering with CS is that for some newly admitted students, sometimes the SLR has not been popping up, and it's supposed to. So if you have newly admitted graduate students that are out there, and again, I would recommend asking your departments to request a query so that you can actually um, find the students um, in your department and that way you can see what their statuses are. That was my next question is, who should we go to in grad division for that query because, <laughs> boy, do I need it. Um, at this point, I'm, uh -oh. at, at, <laughs> <laughs> at this point, I'm going to have to say Andrew Smith. Um, he's going to be really upset with me. <laughs> but I don't know how else we can provide these, these, you know, I heard you say that and I was thinking, uh oh, we'll have to figure out how we're going to do that. Um, I, Andrea, I can, I can see Jarrett's back there discussing. Uh, Sorry. Do you have a sense of how we can get these new student um, California residency versus non-residency reports? Andrea, okay. let me. Jared is saying a ticket to SIS probably. If you guys want to try to work on ourselves and grab it, but we probably need some assistance from the report writer, writers. Okay. I'll tell yeah. you what, let me see what I can do, and also, again, Jarrett, you two in, in contact with Ross Nolan, who I work with, to perhaps if he can help generate the query that can be made public for you all. Again, again, some other ideas, some other yeah. alternate ways to. Be able to do that. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, and I, Andrea I uh, and Jared, if you can send me a note saying that that's what you need, <laughs> I can give you some tips on what, what things you will need to have on that query. Okay. 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 All right, I'm looking at Jared because he's going to do that. Okay. Because I'm standing here. Okay. Um, we're going to take just a, one more question for a few, because we want to give the grad assembly their opportunity. They've come back twice. They were supposed to be the top, uh, the, the full show at our April 27th meeting, and then we had to close our building on April 27th. So. We want to give them at least uh, half an hour. Um, it sounds like there may be a lot of specific questions and people know how to reach you, but I saw one more hand. It was Seth. Okay. I just wanted to know if we have the ability to view that residency status on an individual basis. Yes. Now. So Are here's where you go to. Go to Cal Central. If mm -hmm. you have view access for Cal Central, go under My Academics and go to the status and holds card. Okay. Is that on the student's record? Correct. Yep. Like student view. Student view, yes. So go into, if you can log in in Cal Central, it's view as. I think most of you should have that access, hopefully. Then, um, yes, under my academics, under the status and holds card, you'll be able to see the student's residency. Keep in mind, too, there'll, there'll be a status there, but there's a, sometimes additional information. So um, click on the drop down, and you'll see additional notes there for the student's status. Yes. Yes. So you know that Cal Central is the user interface of CS, and we've had issues with that interface over the past year. Well, um, believe, la last year, if you just get a sense, last year we had students that were really residents in, in, the, in the back end of the system, but were showing up as non-residents, and then we had the reverse of that happening. So I can imagine you know, it, was, it was my headache last year. I'm still trying to recover from it, frankly. But um, right now, yes. Currently, the current residency status is basically in real time. Once we change it, in the, essentially about one or two minutes, it basically flips and changes. And the other thing we were working on, too, is making sure that the student, here's the other headache I was having, a student who gets switched from resident or non-resident to resident, their fees weren't changing either. So I, I know so I talked to some of you about this last year as well. That, that was a nightmare. So I was helping out with Ricky and talking with the folks at the project to make sure that we get our fees correct. That, by and large, has been fixed, too. So everything you see and the fees all should happen pretty quickly. If we change a student status, it usually changes within 20 minutes. Okay. Okay. Thank you so sure. much, Ron. Let's give Ron a huge round of applause. And 
now I'd like to invite up Kenna Hazelwood Carter, who is the president of the Graduate Assembly for the second year. Now we are so delighted that we get a second year to work with her and her leadership team. And so I'm going to ask her to take it from here and um, introduce your colleagues. Will do. Get out of your way. Hi everyone, thank you so much for giving us this time. Thank you also for everything that you do. We know that you are crucial linchpins for graduate students on this campus, even though sometimes you are not recognized <laughs> as that. And we just want you to know, I actually asked um, the other members of the executive board of the, I think there's people watching, so that's why you need this for me, okay. Otherwise, like the teacher in me just wants to use my voice, but I understand. Um, I asked the other executives, you know, what is it that you'd like to convey to the GSAOs? And they said, we really want them to know that for many of us, they are the reason that we were able to make it through our programs. Right? When you know, we were in areas of distress, when we had no idea what the right resource was, they were the reason that we were able to make it through. So I just wanted you to know <laughs> that this was something that was a pretty universally felt. Um, there were some concerns around the fact that sometimes we don't know who you are in our departments or in our academic unit. And it wasn't that we didn't know that you were important, it's just for some students they didn't know who you were or how to find you and that that was a concern. So I know that there's some departments that do a better job of highlighting you <laughs> than others, um, but just to let you know that. So very quickly, my name is Kenna Hazelwood Carter. I am the outgoing and incoming president for the Graduate Assembly. Um, I'm from these Graduate School of Education, specifically I'm doing my PhD in school psychology. And so I am really excited to be able to help remove barriers to learning, right? That is literally what I'm doing my PhD in. And so being in this room with others who do the same thing, removing barriers to learning has been really lovely for me. Um, Tris, would you like to introduce yourself? Uh, my name is Shreyas Patankar. I am the incoming Campus Affairs Vice President uh, for the GA for the coming year. And I'm a graduate student in the Physics Department. Um, and I look forward to working with you all over the coming year. Hi, I'm Jamie Linkoff. I am the incoming Internal Vice President for the GA. And I am a fourth year student in the Department of Chemical Engineering. Also, very happy to be here and looking forward to working with you. So interestingly for the GA, this split between the humanities and STEM is actually pretty representative. We are much more um, made up of people from STEM fields in part because, you know, we were joking earlier that, you know, Maslow's hierarchy, right? When you have your basic needs met, then you can start to look at more aspirational and policy focus. Those of us in the humanities have some more basic needs to be met, let's say. Um, and so it's something where that is really one of our concerns and one of the things that the GA does. We kind of came into existence, if for those of you who don't know our history, in response to the need to really have student voice seen specifically in a political fashion. So during the 1950s, 60s, um, and really much longer than that, uh, the ASUC was funding the Greek societies and still continues to, however, the Greek societies that they were funding were segregated and a number of graduate students had gone and been part of the Freedom Summer and Freedom Writers and came back and said, we really don't think student fees should be supporting racism. We would like to talk about that on Sproul Plaza. And they were banned. And so a lot of the graduate students were kind of expelled from the ASUC. And that's very much where the kind of free speech movement happened and the GA kind of arose from that need for graduate students to recognize that sometimes we are not in lockstep with undergraduates. Technically, the ASUC is the student body government for all students. Technically, graduate students could and have in the past run to be various um, elected officials, including senators. The amount of work that they do <laughs> and the amount of money they get paid to do it, unfortunately, in recent times has not been sufficient to get graduate students to go back into that space. And so graduate students typically remain in the GA. Um, the GA has traditionally also met specific needs that were not being addressed by the campus. So for instance, there was not any uh, mechanism to recruit or retain students of color. So we have a 
project that was created for that, which is our graduate student recruitment and retention project. Amazing. It says exactly what it is that it does. And so we actually have nine different um, project directors as part of the GA that we fund and whose job it is to do at least one event every month specifically targeted for their affinity area. So we have the graduate student parent advocacy project. We have the queer and trans. We have um, the women of color. We have the graduate women's project. We have the graduate social club. Right? There's not a lot of campus-wide social community building um, organizations on this campus, so we saw that was a need. And so each one of our nine different projects really arose from an identified need. We're looking this year to see if maybe we need to shift some Maybe we need to bring a new one in um, because it's something where we really try to be a living organization that is nimble enough to kind of step into spaces that a larger bureaucracy sometimes cannot. And so that's what a, a part of what we do. Another piece, and that's really what those of us sitting here as well as we have two other vice presidents. One is our vice president of finance. The other is our vice president of um, external affairs. That will be... Um, Andy Schwartz and, thank you, Jonathan Morris, respectively. Um, we really focus on what are those chronic and acute issues that are coming up. So for instance, this past year, when there were concerns around undocumented and immigrant um, graduate students and their ability to travel to conferences, for instance, right? Something that's really important for graduate students. You know, I meet with the chancellor, with, the, you know, the Dean of Grad Div, I meet with um, the EVCP, I meet with um, the Vice Provost for the faculty, I mean, like pretty much anybody that I can get into a room with, like I'm constantly knocking on their door and mo most of them I have a standing meeting once a month. And we were immediately saying, okay, so we understand that you're focused on the legal piece, but how about this professional development piece? This is really, really important for graduate students. How can we begin to advocate for them? How can we begin to give them opportunities? Maybe it's just domestically that we support them. You know, if they can't travel by plane, maybe how do we support them getting a ticket on rail? Like, what are the ways that we can begin to troubleshoot at a much more granular level? One of the things that we focused on great with SIS, Andrea and Fiona were amazing <laughs> working with us and meeting with us constantly while we were trying to make sure that disbursements were happening for graduate students. You know, I am an AB 540 student. I'm born and raised in San Francisco, but I left for 15 years to my undergraduate. I did a master's. I taught high school for five years in Brooklyn, but when I came back, there was no way I was going to be paying out of state residency. And so that was really important for me to be able to go through that process. And so that was a huge concern for us was AB 540 students. Like, are they also going to be caught in this issue? And so we brought that up because it was something that just hadn't been thought of in that moment. And it's not because we don't see all of the work that you and every other different part of the um, the university isn't caring about. It's just we know that sometimes there's a question that because we're currently living the graduate student experience, we're slightly closer to or might identify something that's not going to come up as readily to your minds. One of the other things that we did, we had five different fireside chats with the chancellor. And I know that um, there's different feelings around the efficacy of those, but we shifted them this year. And I think in a really beautiful way, got a lot of really fantastic um, concessions and then things that were immediately implemented. And the way that we shifted them this year was that we brought in those of you who are really salient to helping to implement these changes into the room with the students who are most affected, with the administrators who kind of have the power to say, yes, in fact, we want to green light this. So for instance, we had a fireside chat on the state of black graduate and professional students on this campus. There's 384 of us out of 11,000 graduate students. We have made, continually since 1996 been only 3% of the total population, and it's the same for both undergraduates and graduates, that same 3%. Um, and so we said, you know, what does this mean for us to be such a small percentage? What does it mean? Because, and the reason we had that fireside chat is because we were having all of the conversations about non undocumented students. We were having all the conversations around Muslim students and other immigrant students, which were in fact acute issues, but that chronic issue wasn't on people's radar anymore. And so that's really what the GA tries to do is to balance what are the different needs that are happening simultaneously and to make sure that things aren't lost, that we can continue to have those conversations as I have my monthly meetings, as Shreyas will continue to have his monthly meetings, same with Jamie. And so it's really something where you as GSAOs are closer to those pieces. There might be something institutionally that you pick up on 
that students might not be aware of, that's something that could come up and really, really hurt students. For instance, two years ago, there was the issue around dependent coverage, right? That was a huge issue for students with families, and the students with families disproportionately are graduate students, disproportionately those are students of color, disproportionately those are students who are generally the first in their family, certainly to go into a graduate degree, sometimes school, a college at all. And so how do we support, even though it's a much smaller percentage, we immediately as a GA began having meetings with Pahar, with Aunt Claudia, with Aunt, I was in part of those as well, lots of fun. But very quickly we were able to shift the conversation, get that back as part of our coverage, as well as gain a lot of other concessions that were really important to Berkeley students. And so it really is something, I hope I'm kind of conveying to you the fact that the GA is not just one thing, that we don't have just one thing that we care about, and that we really try to bring new things in as they become important, and that we hope to communicate with you um, in ways that really begin to address the particular needs of your academic unit, and that we ask that you, in turn, reach out to us. If there's some area that you are seeing is of issue, you know, one thing that was brought to us was around DSP, right? That students weren't able to get the interpreters that they needed, and so, you know, I. Actually, I have a meeting with Karen today <laughs> to talk about how do we improve that going into the future and make those requests. You know, we had a wonderful win with CACSIF where we, for the first time ever, are having a graduate student dedicated full-time FTE specifically in DSP, right? So that way we can get those things together, but that's because, you know, as the GA, we go into rooms, sometimes we say, I don't see Fiona, I don't see Andrea, I don't see Larissa. Hey, grad students should be represented in this space. How can we do that? And so it's something where, if you think I should bring something up, let me know. Because I, I really rely on others. Like I, my job is almost catch and release. <laughs> like somebody brings something to me and I immediately like shunt it to the right person. Um, but I really try very hard to, to the best of my ability, to be all things to all people. Um, because there are 11,000 graduate students and we don't have a lot of time. Right, you see this, we're trying to get degrees sometimes in one year, we're trying to get a degree in a decade, depending upon <laughs> what that particular field is and the particular challenges that we're facing. Hopefully it's not a decade, though I know a few. Um, but it's your support that helps get us out. <laughs> and ultimately, you know, as Fiona likes to say, I love you all, but I also want to see you leave, right? And we'd like to leave with a degree. And so that is really where we see um, you come in. The one thing I will say finally is when it comes to communication, we have a, different, a couple of different ways that we communicate with graduate students, and it's not always the most precise. Um, it's not always the most effective. We do a weekly delegates digest where we collect information from the different PD if other groups reach out to us and say, we think this is something that all graduates should know about. And I send it out to my delegates. My delegates are then supposed to send it out to their constituents, which is whoever's in their academic unit. As I'm sure you know where I'm going with this, it's a little bit of a leaky pipeline. <laughs> and on top of that, not all departments and academic units are represented in the GA. Some of them perennially are not represented, which means those are academic units that never get this information. We know that Grad Div has their monthly newsletter that goes out, but that doesn't cover some of the things that we cover. And so trying to get more coverage, you know, we worked with Larissa last year to try and make, you know, every other week to maybe every four to five weeks something from us to then go out to you, to then go out to the other graduate students. But we're really trying to figure out how best to, to communicate. If you have anything that you can give us as tools or tips, that would be amazingly supportive. If there's anything that you see as areas, ooh, yeah. Absolutely, thank you. And, and part of, I think, the reason that we weren't sending as much to you is because if you see our um, Grad Digest, I mean, it can be 20 different items on it, and that's weekly. And so I didn't want to send you like 100 <laughs> different items. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. I appreciate that. And I just, I didn't want to flood your mailbox. I think is where that ended up coming. But that's really helpful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
So, sure. Uh, so the question was, um, when do we re-up in terms of when do we run for office? So our bylaws dictate that our elections can happen no earlier than March. Um, in the past, elections have happened in March for this year. For the first time, we had them in April because we wanted to have our budget meeting in March, and I think we found that to be a really helpful change. Um, as far as when we shift in terms of administration, July 1. So I will go from being president to being president <laughs> on July 1. <laughs> Jamie will move from being the um, internal chief of staff as well as my chief of staff, which I'm very grateful that he's been wearing both hats, July 1, and Shreyas will become the CAVP on July 1. That's the beginning of fall, generally. Um, do you want to speak a bit about delegate recruitment and do we do or don't? Um, yeah, so the general process that we go through is to first just reach out to all of our existing delegates and see if they are either continuing as delegates in the coming year uh, or if they have already uh, found a replacement within their department. Uh, that process, I'll probably start pretty soon after transitioning into sometime in July just so we can get a head count of who do we already know we're going to have. Uh, then the uh, bigger work is really in identifying the units that don't have delegates, especially units that haven't had delegates for quite some time. Uh, and this is a place where I would really appreciate your help, especially if you know that you haven't had uh, a delegate. Um, ideally, we'll be able to get uh, one of us from the GA into, uh, sorry, just one minute, uh, get one of us into a space where we can, or. Er, uh, into one of your orientation spaces uh, so that we can give our little spiel, talk for five, ten minutes, say here's who we are, here's what we do, here's how we would like to be able to support you, uh, and how to get involved. Um, yeah, so the question was whether the GA will be able to do the outreach to different departments that uh, don't have any delegates. Uh, yes, that's something that I will be doing. Um, again, that'll be after we've sort of confirmed who those units are, so probably in uh, sometime in July. Ideally, we'll give everyone enough uh, warning before your orientation starts so that we can actually get something scheduled um, without it being too much of a rush. And so if you are interested in seeing if you have delegates on the GA's website, which is ga.berkeley.edu, there is a tab at the top that says delegates, and underneath there it says delegates. Um, the roster. It's the roster for the delegates, and so you can see, like, interestingly, one unit that has not had representation for the last few years is political science, for instance, which I always find really interesting as I was a poli-sci undergrad, so I was like, I would have jumped at this. but. So that's one of those places, and we do, like I think last year we went to 20 different um, orientations because these are people who are not going to be able to join the general NGSO, and so we wanted to make sure that they had an opportunity to hear about what we do. Sure. Uh, so there's four different types of funding that the GA does, which often is how we get people interested, is like, we have money. Um, we have GEMER, which is a graduate meeting and event. Um, and you can get $500 through that. And basically, if your academic unit has a group that wants to meet because graduate students want to support each other on a monthly basis and want to buy some food, we will send, give them $500 per semester where they can do that. They do have to submit. Um, again, it's ga.berkeley.edu, and the tab is funding. And then it pulls down, it tells you exactly when all the deadlines are. I don't think we have the deadlines for next year up yet because we haven't made that transition. So when the new person comes in July 1, it will be Jonathan um, Mintz. Thank you. Um, and he will go through the funding guide and see, but it tells you what you can get money for, what you can't get money for. We give money to publications. So if there's a publication that your academic unit is putting on and you need some funds, we can actually help to support that. Um, if there's a event, for instance, I know the GSE, we have Research Day. 
if you have an RSO that is attached to that event, you can get money for that. We also have um, contingency, which is our funding that happens outside of our traditional semesters. So if you're going to have an event that's either over the summer or over um, intercession, I guess it's not what you call it, but that's what I have in my head from undergrad, um, then we can also provide funds to that as well. And so again, that $500 cap. However, for publications, it can be more. Um, the last type of funding that we have is actually travel grants. And so if you have graduate students who are trying to go somewhere, meaning all of you, um, then you are, they can apply to it. They have to have already been accepted. And so have proof of that acceptance of a poster, of a talk that they're giving. But it's $300. And it's um, done kind of by lottery. So whoever gets their hat in the ring, we can, they have a chance of getting money, which is always really helpful. Yes. Uh, so the question slash concern was around DSP and making sure that students get the services that they need um, and to really kind of highlight where those gaps are in coverage and service. And I 100% agree and share. As, yeah, no, this year has been, part of it has been, there's been a lot of turnover just generally in that program in terms of who's been leading it. And so that's been a part of the concern. Um, and as I said, I am meeting with Karen today just to kind of talk about that. And I would love to partner with you because as many allies as we can. One of the people that um, I've been reaching out to and I'm looking to have more conversations with is Kira Griscavage, who's the chief, what is it, something in risk officer. Compliance, Compliance thank you. <laughs> you know, I, I have all the words. It's just <laughs> accessing them sometimes. <laughs> Um, I'm really good at recognition when you tell me the right one. And so, <laughs> um, but again, about how do we make sure this happens? Because I agree, it's something that, again, school psychology, literally special needs, special education, any sort of area, that's what I'm researching and focusing on. One area that I'm actually working on with her is my program traditionally has been part of the evaluation and certification process. In the last two years, we haven't. And so that's created a bit of a bottleneck in terms of getting students who need services identified and being able to register for them. And so we're looking at how can we bring you know, students from my program back into that role to try and streamline it. In addition to now having a full-time person specifically for graduate students, we hope that will also help. Um, I think part of the issue has been there just hasn't been enough people there to just read and monitor what those needs are. And, yeah, and so because there just hasn't been that ability, we end up with these issues. And I'm, it breaks my heart because I see how transformative getting the proper support can be for students. Um, and we often talk about, well, we're an elite institution, so everybody who's here is supposed to be able to just get through it on their own. It's like, that's not how learning works. <laughs> you know, nobody gets in it, get, gets in and then gets through because they just magically know how to do it all. Like you wouldn't come here at all if you could do it without <laughs> any additional training or help. Um, so definitely, if there's anybody else who has any specific issue or need around that, please feel free to email me. My email address is president at ga.berkeley.edu. Yeah. But if there's something in particular that you would like to highlight, I. I'm always really interested to find a new cause to champion. Thank you, Jamie. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, any other questions in particular? Or you can continue talking. Mm -hmm. um, back to the grant. Yes. 
separate. Right. Unfortunately, yeah. I know, and it's the part of the concern is the way that um, we our funds are very much tied to like professional development. Professional development should include just attendance, but because people who are actively adding to their CV by presenting or having a paper and things like that are still not able to fund it, and so that's why that was seen as the area of most need. Anything else? We can go back to talking about the GA more generally. Okay. Um, thank you so much. Th any more questions for the GA or you have her email address if you want to? Oh, and then so oh, okay. just one la other thing. Yeah, question and then. Yeah. Our physical space, of course. So we're in 444 Eshelman and we have a couple of really amazing things that we're doing this year. One, we are creating a graduate student only CPS satellite office within the graduate assembly offices. So it'll be 444D Eshelman. And we're looking to have that up and running by the beginning of the fall. We're working on it right now with Amy and Sue. Um, because we've heard from graduate students that they are not comfortable going into waiting rooms where they potentially will see their students. And so this is a need that we saw that we're actively looking to respond to. Um, we'll be sending out communications when that is up and running. We're also working with the SLS to create a graduate student only walk-in day in 444D Eshelman as well, because we want graduate students to know that student legal services exists, right? That, that they have questions, that they need help. What we found, I met with the um, SLS on Monday, and one of the things that came up is that graduate students typically have more repeat visits to their office. It's not a one and done because we typically feel more agentic in handling the low <laughs> hanging fruit. And so when we finally go in, it's because it gets a little hairy. And it's things including divorce, including you know child custody, including um, immigration issues sometimes. However, now in the Dreamer's office, they do have um, an immigration attorney there who's doing amazing work. But these are the things that are really important. We're trying to highlight these services for graduate students and providing it to them in a way that they really feel like they can connect and not have to worry about those other potential barriers to access. Um, one thing also that we're working with Larissa and Gravdiv around is creating what we're going to be calling the grad book in a way, but it's a guidebook um, app that is going to have graduate student resources and a different events and other things that graduate students can kind of carry around with them and not have to kind of go through as many different emails and websites to hopefully help streamline that for graduate students and also make them feel like they have more of a community. And so we'll be also um, communicating with you all when we get that put together. Um, another thing that we're working on, and I don't know if you recall, but last year for the first time ever we had Grad Fest, which was a resources fair for graduate students incoming that was on the back half of NGSO. We know that a lot of you, especially if you represent a professional program or school, have your own NGSO that happens at the same time as a campus-wide one. However, we would ask, if at all possible, to work into your schedule, time for your students to come to GradFest, because this is going to be where they can you know, meet with and t see you know, different clubs. They can see different, um, talk to UCPD if that's something important for them, for Tang, like all these other spaces that they might not necessarily have somebody they can get face-to-face -face with immediately to see these other resources. And then afterwards, we're putting together pub crawl. I know not everybody is of age, which means we will also have a nice little like tea and coffee or something area. Um, but we want graduate students to feel like they can immediately begin to meet people outside of their own academic unit because they really need that. They really need a broader community and they need, we need them to feel like this is part of their campus. This is their school, that they are part of Berkeley and not just I'm a physics doctoral student, even though I'm super happy to have you. Um, but part of the reason that I joined the GA is I wanted to interact with people from across the campus, and there's very few opportunities for that. We actually are going to be planning a grad fest for all 11,000 plus graduate students to attend in February, and so we'll send out information around that. But we are really, really working hard to root graduate students to this campus to make sure that they feel like they're supported, to make sure they feel like they're seen, and to make their issues ones that are truly seen as on par with 
any other students need. And when we, I say students, I actually do mean everyone, as opposed to when often it's said on other parts of the campus where it's just undergraduates. Um, and so that's also part of like, our huge advocacy is just the graduate student scene. There's an undergraduate initiative. We're trying to make a graduate student initiative happen because we deserve it, darn it. <laughs> Any, okay. Um, I think three o'clock. Yeah, three to four thirty. Anything else for the grad assembly? Anything else you want to know before we bring a new cohort of students in? Okay. Well, thank you so much for letting us speak to you. Thank you for all you do. And thank you. So we have just a few minutes left. Is there anything else? that anyone in the room wants to uh, talk about, mention, quick questions, anything? Or do you want to get back to the snacks, which there are plenty of snacks in the back of the room? I recommend that. Oh, we do have one question. I just wanted to introduce myself. My name is Todd Kilbrunner, and I've been uh, chosen to replace Mabel Lee in our history department. And so I'll leave the GSA over there. All right, thank you. Welcome, Todd. Todd from History has just introduced himself. For those of you that are streaming, um, join us next time if you can, but we're glad you in, uh, were able to catch the information. I'd like to thank Rod and the Grad Assembly again, and we'll see you next time. Thank you, Rod.